Oh, man, it's so, listen, y'all slept in today. Good morning. How you feeling? Oh, man, it's so good to see y'all. I'm so glad that you decided to come to church today, whether you're in the room or in our video venue or watching online. It's just a great day to be in church. We're continuing our series called All In, and it's our opportunity to really look at what God has called us to and where he is calling us to go and how do we take those next steps. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit continuing from last week's talk about origins and how that affects where we're going today. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42, and it's my custom to stand. Would you stand with me as we go there? I've got a couple of friends from Augusta with me this morning, hanging out with us. Can we just give them a Mountain West welcome real quick? (laughs) Friends of mine. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And it reads, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I want to talk to you for a few moments today about your next step. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would say in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, This week, Friday, we had an opportunity to go on a little road trip. And what my family likes to do when we go on road trips is we like to listen to albums. And I know that's a little foreign, but, you know, when I was growing up, uh, you could listen to an album. You could start at the first track and go all the way through. I I know now they do singles, and that's not really the case. But, um, okay, I'm dating myself. Wrong room. Great. Anyway... Uh, We like to listen to albums, and we decided to listen to the Hamilton soundtrack, y'all. And boy, was that a good time. Hamilton. Uh, You know, I'm not going to throw away my shot. Um, I got, uh, just like my country, I'm young, scrappy, and hungry, and I'm not going to throw away my shot. It was a great, great time. Um, I, I realized that I had some... If you don't know, Hamilton is the story of Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers of uh, America. And as my oldest was listening to it, he heard a line that said rebels. And he said, "Uh, Daddy, is this a Star Wars song? And so I realized I'll be doing some extra work in American history with him, but it's all good. But I, I began to reflect on the founding fathers and our nation. You know, it's easy to start something. Maintaining and growing it is a little bit harder. You know, uh, Thomas Paine, one of uh, another founding father, he said, those who benefit from freedom must endure the fatigue of supporting it. Uh, If I can paraphrase one of the lines uh, George Washington has in Hamilton, he said, dying is easy. Living and by living, governing and making something out of this nation is harder. Our biblical passage introduces us to the origin story of the church. What are the building blocks and the foundation of the church? How has this thing that started with uh, a group of fishermen and a random group of people now covered the entire earth? What were the building blocks that made it what it is today? And I want to show you in today's time, how essential it is that you know the roots of the fruit of the tree that you're coming from. There are some places that have uh, the form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And our biblical passage tells us the roots of, and what we like to say here at Mountain West is that we are a Bible-based church. What that means is who we are is rooted as best as we can. We are flawed individuals. The only way to have a perfect church is to kick us all out and uh, build it new, and it still would have flaws because humans made it. But we, as best as we can, are trying to live out the faith that was handed to us long ago. And if I could summarize who Mountain West is, what 
our, our vision, what we are called to do is we exist to help one more experience hope by taking their next step towards God. That, that our mission is rooted in what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 28, go into the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This call is an echo to us, and this uh, passage is the next step in their process of building out that which God had given them assignment to do. And I want to show you the, the core tenets that they had, which we continue to echo today, that I believe will shape and frame how we are going to take our next step. Let me tell you up front at the beginning, so you have time to process. At the end of this service, I'm going to, ch- this gathering, I'm challenging you to take your next step. That there is a next step that you have to take based on what you hear today. Here, here are the building blocks, what they focused on. Here's the first one they focused on teaching. The scripture says, his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The word of God is so important. Theology, that that word literally means the way you think about God, what you believe of God, is so important because the way you think affects the way you behave. And if I have wrong thinking, then I'm going to have wrong behavior. And so what, what they focus on, look at verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to get their orthodoxy, which is just a, a big word for belief, they wanted to get that right because it affects your orthopraxy, which is what you do. The, the, this is, here, here's how, how I know sometimes we've got uh, wrong orthodoxy and orthopraxy because sometimes the same mouth you use to bless and worship God is the same mouth you use to cut somebody out. And the same hand you lift and worship is the same one you turn the other side on 285. Well, not y'all, y'all sweetly saved, but the mother folk. And here, here, here's why it's so important because the right teaching shapes our lives and guards our life. Here, here's what uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It's important for you to know what you believe. And, and, and let, me, let me say it like this. Um, here at Mountain West, we've got a saying because I, I know we come from a variety of backgrounds. If I ask you what your faith tradition, some of you are Baptists, some of you uh, Methodists, some of you are heathen, great, we're all here, I get it. But the, the, the thing that is important is in our essential beliefs, we have four core essential beliefs, we have unity. These are things we're not going to budge on. In our non-essential beliefs, we have liberty. What, what I mean by that is if you grew up Methodist, they sprinkled you when you get baptized. If you come to Mountain West, we're going to dunk you. Either way, we're not going to fight about those things. A church is the only army that wounds its own soldiers. We've spent too much time in fighting instead of doing the work and the assignment that God has called us to do. We are not here at Mountain West. Uh, we, you, if you like to bicker about secondary things, this is probably not the place for you because we're not going to make those fights. We're, in everything, we're going to have love and charity for each other. But here are our four core beliefs. Number one, the Bible is the word of God. This is not just a suggestion manual. This is not just a book with cool sayings that you can tattoo on yourself. This literally is the word of God. All 66 books, 1189 chapters are God's words inspired to us. They guard our lives. They affect our decision making. It literally is the word of God. Number two, that Jesus is the son of God. That he is not just some guy, if you're short on lunch money, he'll break you off some bread and fishes. He literally is the son of God. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. When he saw our sins, he chose the cross. He died on a cross for us. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. On the third day, he rose and he is coming back again for his church. That what the Bible says about Jesus is true. Here's the third core belief or essential belief of ours is that a decision to follow Jesus changes everything. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably heard it like this, that you you must be born again. Um, There's one uh, particular denomination that says you can't join in, you got to be born in. Uh, But 
the, the whole point behind that is that following Jesus changes everything. The, the word in the Greek for repentance literally means to turn and go in the opposite direction. That I was walking one way and then I decide to go another way. And this is a tension point for a lot of people. We know of Jesus, but we're not following Jesus. And friends, it's not the same thing. Information without application does nothing for you. You can know how to turn on the TV, but if you don't ever push the power button, that TV is going to stay off. Knowing of Jesus and following Jesus are two different things. And the decision to follow Jesus changes everything. And it, this is the choice that every person has to deal with. God gives humanity choice. In the book of Deuteronomy, he says, today I put before you life and death. In the book of Joshua, he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. God has given humanity choice, and he's asking us to follow Jesus. Here's the fourth and uh, final core belief is that a believer can and should be filled with the Holy Spirit, that he empowers us to do the work that he has called us to do, to live out, equips us with gifts to live out the call of God on our life. And so they focus on the apostles' teaching so that their orthodoxy and their doctrine would be right so that they could live out the life that God had called them to. Romans 12 and 1 said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is washed with the word of God. So they have been saturated with the good news of God, the good news of our Savior. And then they start gathering together. Here, here's what they do. They gather for worship in large group. The, these are our weekend gatherings. They, they would gather together in corporate worship. And let, let me say how important this is. Psalm 133 and 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 122 and 1, he says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go until the house of the Lord. The, the reason is there is something special about the corporate gathering of believers together. Something unique. God's presence is anywhere, everywhere. You know, my wife makes fun of me because sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm just worshiping in the car and, you know, a tear come down and I'm, she's like, what's wrong with you? I just, God's presence is everywhere. But there is something unique about when you gather together in a corporate setting, worshiping God. You get a glimpse of what God intends for us to experience for eternity. Revelation 7 and 9 says, every tribe, every nation, and every tongue crying glory to the Lamb, that we together with one voice are worshiping God. There is something that happens in the atmosphere. Heaven comes down. Scripture says that he inhabits or dwells in the praises of his people. Scripture says where two or three are gathered, there he is, and whatever we ask for, it shall be done. There is something uniquely special about being in the presence of God together. And here's what the enemy would want you to think, that this is not as important. You know, I've heard people say to me, you know, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian and believe in God. And I say, you're right. And I don't have to go home to be married, but I don't know how long I'll stay married if I don't go home. <laughs> it, it, it is connected together. It's so important. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. He, he says in Hebrews 10 and 25, don't neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Friends, outside of your decision to follow Jesus, one of the most important things that you are supposed to do is to pass on the faith to the next generation. And what you make optional will become irrelevant for the next generation. What you treat with apathy will be something that they don't even consider for the next generation. We've got to be careful not to think because my relationship with God is secure that I miss realizing that my children 
being in church weekly is foundational to their relationship with God. Friends, you can't pour out what's never been poured in. Here's what he says, that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That doesn't come unless it's already been poured in. And spiritual maturity is not doing the great things occasionally. It is not posting what you believe on social media. It's doing the simple things consistently. Fathers, let, let, let me talk to you for a moment. You, you want to know the best thing that you can do to lead your family besides just being present, showing up, and being a good man? It's consistently taking them to church. Leading your family in this will change the direction of your family for eternity. H- here's why. Here's what Scripture says. Train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Some of you are in church today after your crazy 20s because the promise of God from your mother and your grandmother, from your father and your grandfather, training you up in the way that you should go. Don't miss the value. And (laughs) let me say this. As the world shifts to a life of convenience, God's call is a life of commitment. He he didn't call us to a life of 30-day trials, but he called us to follow him completely and totally. Here's the next thing that they were intentional about is that they developed as disciples. If you notice, the teaching prompted things to be done in their midst and begin to change their behavior, and they were walking out the truth of Scripture together. God's work in your life is best seen by the fruit in your life. He he didn't save you just for fire insurance. He saved you to take some next steps after that. And so here at Mountain West, we've got eight markers of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, what, what it looks like if you're saying, all right, I, I attend Mountain West, I, I'm here at Mountain West, what are markers that we are looking for for people who are followers of Jesus Christ? Number one is to be kind. I can't tell you how many sour-faced Christians I have connected with, and you wonder why your friends don't want to hear nothing about Jesus. Yeah. Right? You know what Scripture says? It is the kindness of God that compels humanity to repentance. It is not you shouting at them. It is not all the other things that you do. It is you living out the truth of Jesus. And in fact, I would say until kindness has become part of who you are, there are still pieces of your heart that are not surrendered to God. Kindness is a marker of people who are walking with Jesus. Number two is Share your story. Here's what scripture says. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. All that means is if God has done something for you, you should tell somebody about it. That that if God has changed your life somehow, some way, and here, again, here's what the enemy would want you to believe, that because I've messed up, I have nothing to tell somebody. Can I tell you, his strength is made perfect in your weakness, In fact, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 and 8, I believe, it says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, meaning broken clay jars. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency or the source of the power may be of God and not of man. Your, Your life is a testimony of the goodness of God, and he wants you to tell somebody about it, to share your story. It doesn't have to be perfect. But God has given you a sphere of influence, who you know, where you go, and what you do, that literally can change somebody's life. Number three is to invite people to church. And I'm so glad that, uh, you know, our church is so invitational. I can't tell you how many times people have brought somebody up to me and said, this is my friend who invited me to church. When I ask people how they got to our church, 
70 to 80 percent of the time, it's because somebody invited them to church. If you've experienced hope here, you should share that and bring somebody along the journey. Number four is to attend weekly. And we, we just talked about that, but weekly church attendance is a part of being a fully full, uh, devoted follower of Jesus Christ. It, it's essential. It's helpful. Number five is um, you serve consistently. You are not create. Let me put it like this. God has no spectators in this kingdom. Everyone is called to participate in moving his kingdom forward. Number six, you, you join a small group. That community is not optional, it's essential. Number seven, that you give generously. The truth is, followers of Jesus are always marked by generosity. Followers of Jesus, one of the markers is that they are generous people. Look, look at what, what it says in verse 46. It says they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 44, and all who believed had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any who had need. Generous people, Jesus' people are generous people. And number eight, make spiritual decisions. Here's what that means, is just continuing to take steps in the direction that God has called you to go. The initial steps are saying yes to Jesus, to follow Jesus, being baptized, which is a public declaration of that private decision. But some next steps are 21 days of prayer, Bible reading, leading a small group. There, there's always a next spiritual step to take. Here's what Paul said. Paul, who wrote 70% of the New Testament, he was caught up to the third heaven, saw visions and wonders. He says, not that I have obtained, not that I have arrived, but I press towards the mark of the high calling for them that are in Christ Jesus. If Paul still had work to do, we have next steps to do. So it, if this is the case, this is the markers of Jesus, uh, followers of Jesus Christ, they continue to develop as disciples. Here, here's the next thing that they made a priority is that they lived in community. Fr friends, you, you miss pieces of the gospel if you get the vertical right and you miss the horizontal. Jesus died so that you could be made right with the Father, but he intended for you to enjoy this journey with others. Over and over through Scripture, we're encouraged. It, it, scripture says that brothers are born for a time of adversity, uh, that iron sharpens iron. It is important for us to do life together with others. Here's what Galatians 6 and 2 says. Bear one another burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I, I can't tell you how essential small group and community is. Because in my darkest moments, it was small group that was there for me. It was community. Now, I remember November 23rd, 2011, like it was yesterday. I had just spoken to my father that morning, and we were supposed to uh, meet at the grocery store. And he didn't show up at the grocery store. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and so I thought he was just busy. And a few hours go by, and we can't reach him. And so now we're in a little bit of a panic and we're calling everybody who would know him. And my mother and my brother went out to search for him and I stayed home just in case he came back home. And then I got the call that they had found him in his car and he was already gone. And by God's grace, one of my brothers who I'm still in community with now lived not too far from me. And I raced over to his house in words that I couldn't explain, screaming in agony because of a loss that I'd never felt. And he got in his car and he rode with me to the hospital and he stayed with me 
While we endured one of the most traumatic seasons of life, friends, you are missing out on what God intends for you to experience if you are not doing life together in community. Jesus, when he was carrying the cross, they brought a man named Simon to help him carry the cross. If our Savior needed somebody to walk with him through his darkness, you need somebody to walk with you through the difficult seasons in your life. You were not made to live life in isolation. You were created for a community. And community should not be optional for you. It should be essential. Here's the next thing that they made a priority is that they intentionally made a difference. Friends, you were created on purpose to fulfill a purpose. And if I could sum up your purpose in one statement, is your purpose is to make a difference in the lives of others. Some of you are in corporate America. Some of you are raising children at home. Some of you are in education. Some of you are in law, a variety of sports, all sorts of places. Can can I tell you what your purpose is? It's to make a difference in the lives of others. This is why you are here. And what the enemy would want you to think is that I don't have anything to offer. Here's how we kill the lies of the enemy with the truth of God's word. Here's what Ephesians says. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he planned for you long ago. So I don't know your story. I don't know all of what you went through. But as long as you got breath, you've got purpose. As long as you got life, God wants to use your story for his glory. And don't give up on yourself because God hasn't given up on you. He wants you to make a difference. And in fact, only what you do for Christ will last. Here's what Matthew 25 and 40 says. This is at the end. And the king will say, I tell you the truth. What you did to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing to me. What you do, you know, um, had the opportunity to last serve day to um, go downtown and uh, be a part of the mission that serves the homeless down uh, near Georgia State. And there were so many people that I saw there that may have been overlooked by others, but we had an opportunity to serve them. But I was riding with the King family And there was a gentleman who was on the side of the road. And they went out of their way to stop their car and make sure that the water that they had for themselves, they gave to this gentleman. And that may seem like something insignificant in that moment. But can I tell you, what you do for those who can do nothing for you, you are doing as unto the Lord. And it makes a difference in their lives. You know, Gandhi said, I love your Jesus, but I don't like your Christians because your Christians say the words of Jesus, but don't live the words of Jesus. When you serve others, you are living out the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't don't miss the opportunity to make a difference. You know, uh, I get emails and reports from people who visit us and tell us what's going on. Can, can I tell you, they don't talk about my preaching. You know, I don't know how I feel about that, but <laughs> they don't really talk about my preaching. They don't really talk about our worship. They'll talk about Pastor Ken, who is in the parking lot waving at people when they come in. They'll talk about the person who greeted them with a smile or who poured their coffee or who gave them a hug or who prayed for them in the hallway. They talk about people that you think your actions meant nothing, but it makes a difference in the lives of others. Don't miss your opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So you came here today and let me tell you the good news. You just walked through our next step class. Congratulations. I know if I told you all, half of y'all would have been at Bedside Baptist this morning, and that's okay. 
Here, here, here's why we want you to hear our Next Step class. It's because we want to remove all the barriers for you taking your next step towards God. And for some of you, it's time for you to take a next step, specifically in the place of joining this church. Some of you have been dating us for a while, all right? I, and I'm grateful. You know, I like dates too. I want, you know, flowers and roses, all that stuff. I get it. But for some of you, it's time to make a commitment. And members at Mountain West Church partner with us in creating, leading, growing, and funding our environments. And if I can frame this, we, we've got what I would call a, a set of unifying attitudes towards fulfilling the mission of the church. You ever been in a car with multiple people who think they know which way you should go? Right? Especially in Atlanta, right? No, take 285. No, no, take 78 to 75. And no, why don't you take 85 and then 400 and 675? Everybody has an idea on where you should go. Okay? Here's what I like to say our unifying attitudes are our roadmap to where God has called us to go. So when everybody get on the bus, you understand where God is taking us as a church. Here's the first unifying attitude. You believe in relentless grace. God never gives up on you, and we shouldn't give up on people. Can, can I tell you the easiest way to have relentless grace? Just remember what God has saved you from. Just remember what God has forgiven you of. It's really hard to be a judgmental person when you realize that you should stand in judgment, but the mercy of God has kept you. And, and, and let me say this, just because somebody's sin looked different than yours, you have no, all of it is the same in the eyes of God. And we need to have relentless grace to chase after with open arms people who need to know of the love of Jesus Christ. Here's the second, is that you believe in biblical truth. Here, here's what I mean. These things go hand in hand. John 1 and uh, 14 says, uh, Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. We are going to be, and what society wants you to pick is you've got to either be all truth or all grace. And like Jesus, we're going to hold on to both pillars and say, we're going to give you all the grace in the world, but we will not compromise the truth of God's word. And whether or not it's popular, we are going to walk the truth of God's word and we're going to walk the truth of God's grace. Here's number three is you believe in hope-filled experiences. All that means is we will do anything short of sin to reach people with the glory of, with the good news of Jesus Christ. And sometimes it seems crazy for us to do certain things that we do for one person until it's your one that you've been praying for. You know, Miss Lisa is here, and she didn't know I was gonna tell this story, but Miss Lisa is here, and she's been praying for her husband for decades believing that God would save him, believing that he would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And a couple of months ago, the Lord impressed on my heart that we should do a Tuesday noon prayer. And I'm talking back to the Lord, like, why Tuesday? Why, why at noon? He said, do a Tuesday noon prayer. I said, God, nobody's going to come up. People are working. All of Tuesday noon prayer. Friends, after decades, that, that Tuesday noon prayer, Lisa's husband out of nowhere decides that he's going to a prayer service at church with her. And he sat here the entire prayer service and at the end of the service, I got to pray the prayer of salvation over decades of him, her waiting and believing and God answered her prayer. And we will do anything to reach anyone with the good news of Jesus Christ. Number four, you believe in forward movement. Here's what that means. Stagnation is not a position for people in the body of Christ. 
Scripture says that He has taken us from glory to glory to glory to glory, that there is always a next step for us, that there are higher heights and deeper depths in Christ Jesus. And we should never get satisfied. Don't get satisfied in the kiddie pool and miss all of what God wants to do in your world and in your life. Number five, you believe in unified diversity. I I, I make you do this almost every week in this series. Look around. This is a picture of heaven, and here's what's required for a room like this. I know so many of us in this room think differently, vote differently, uh, listen to different music, live in different places, different socioeconomic things. Here's what needs to happen. We all lay down our preference for God's ultimate purpose that we be one in Christ. We are unified around the gospel of Jesus. Here's what he says in Ephesians, that in Jesus, he has torn down the wall of hostility. I I don't care how different you are, whatever divides you has been broken by Jesus Christ. And out of these two people, he made one new people. Unified diversity. Number six is that you believe in authentic relationships. And that means that you're going to be intentional about being in community with people that you go to church with. And here's what's important. Let, Let me make this distinction. You don't just need community. You need Christian community. Some of you are stuck where you are because the voices speaking in your life are telling you to go away from God and set it towards God. Authentic relationships. Number seven is you believe in generosity. I said this already. Generosity is a marker of people who walk with Jesus. And let me say clearly, generosity, God's system is not a get rich scheme or a Ponzi scheme. You can't, God, here's $10, I'm expecting $100 on Friday. That's not how this works. Scripture says that God loves a cheerful giver, that they are marked by God because God has given so much that they walk out generosity in their lives. Number eight, you believe in serving in ministry. There are too many of us who have stayed on the sidelines when God is calling us to get in the game. We've been comfortable being served, but here's what Jesus said. I didn't come to serve, be served, but I came to serve others. If we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to serve in God's church. So at the bottom of your, your notes... There's a blank that says, my next step is blank. So what's your next step today? All of us have a next step today. For some of you, that next step is to join the church, to make that move and to commit to being part of God's family in this local body. Some of you, Your growth has been stunted because you're in a pot. And what God wants you to do is to be planted. And you've moved, you've moved, you've moved. Here's what the Lord wants you to do. To be planted and let your roots grow down deep. Some of you need to commit to taking that step. There's others of you that your next step is to serve in ministry. At the conclusion of our gathering today, uh, in the upper lobby, you're going to have an opportunity to see all the variety of ways that you can serve. And if we don't have it yet, guess what? There's a next step table. We will find a way for you to serve. Our job, my job as your pastor, is not just to preach God's word, it's to equip you to do the work of ministry. We will create room for you to serve in God's church. There's other of you that today is the first time that you are going to take a step in generosity. That that you need to give. That that's your next step. And there's some of you, today your next step is to lead a small group. 
to create and cultivate the community that you desire. Wherever you land, here, here's what I, I want you to do. I want you to pray about the next step you want to take, and I want you to write that down. I, I want you to even tell us about that next step, and we will gracefully hold you accountable. Yeah, I see y'all crossing it out right now. Whatever your next step is, today is the day to take it. The biggest next step you could take today is a step of committing to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Maybe you have come to church. Maybe you've walked away from faith before. Maybe you're just exploring Christianity. Here's what I, I want to tell you. Life with Jesus is one step at a time. And he says, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And you don't have to understand it all. Here, here's what faith is. Faith is not knowing everything before you start. Following Jesus is getting your questions answered as you walk. Maybe today that is your next step. Would you pray with me today? Father, we're so grateful that you have given us the awesome privilege to be a part of your family, to be a part of your church, church that you are building and that you are adding to daily. Lord, help us to recognize where you want us to take a next step. God, for the person that needs to take a next step towards you, saying yes to you, Yes to Jesus. I pray today would be their day. And if that's you, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, save me. Change me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Forgive me of my sins. I receive your salvation today. And God, I pray that you would give boldness and conviction to every person under the sound of my voice to take their next step. Wherever you're prompting them, wherever you're leading them, God, do not let them walk away from this call to move from the sidelines into the game, to move further towards where you have called them to. God, I pray gifts to be stirred up. Pray visions and dreams. Bless your people today. Help them to follow you the way that you've intended. In Jesus' name we pray. And every heart say amen, amen, and amen.